Good afternoon. My name is Barrett Goetz, and I'm one of the student assistants here with the Youth Ministry Institute at Yale. Uh, we want to warmly welcome all of you to our second lunch and lecture of the semester. Um, and we're especially glad that you joined us on Ash Wednesday. Um, I know for many of us, uh, today marks the start of a really important season in the life of our churches or our own devotional life. Um, and since it's our custom to start these lunches and lectures with a moment of worship, whether that's musical or something else, um, I'd like to begin our time in worship together by reading a poem. Uh, this poem is called Ash Wednesday. It's by Malcolm Geit, who's a wonderful poet and priest from the Church of England, and he teaches at Cambridge. So if you would, um, would you bow your heads with me in prayer uh, as I read this poem as our act of worship? <clears throat> Receive this cross of ash upon your brow, brought from the burning of Palm Sunday's cross. The forests of the world are burning now, and you make late repentance for the loss but all the trees of God would clap their hands and the very stones themselves would shout and sing if you could covenant to love these lands and recognize in Christ their Lord and King. He sees the slow destruction of these trees. He weeps to see the ancient places burn. And still you make what purchases you please and still to dust and ashes you return. But hope could rise from ashes even now, beginning with this sign upon your brow. Lord, we thank you for the gift of good food to strengthen our bodies, for fellowship, for our guests from the community of New Haven and beyond, for the students that it's a privilege to study alongside here. And Lord, we thank you for uh, this food and this time together. We pray for our speakers. Uh, and for each one present, that you would make yourself known to each one of us today. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Hello, everyone. 
So I'm going to introduce the speakers today. I'm very honored to introduce these three wonderful speakers, especially my former one mentor, Dr. Sarah Farmer. Sarah exemplified to me what it means to be a theologian and a loving pastor. Before moving to Indiana Wesleyan University in fall of 2018, she served as an associate research scholar and a lecturer at Yale Divinity School and helped direct the Adolescent Faith and Flourishing Program at uh, Yale Center for Faith and Culture. Sarah received her MDiv and PhD from Emory University, where she taught as an adjunct professor and uh, co-directed a Certificate in Theological Studies program at a women's prison. Dr. Sarah Farmer is currently Assistant Professor of Practical Theology and Community Development in the School of Theology and Ministry at Indiana Wesleyan University. As a practical theologian, she not only teaches community development courses, but also teaches in the areas of psycho psychosocial identity and faith formation, youth ministry, and transformative pedagogy. Dr. Sarah Farmer co-founded the Youth Arts and Peace Camp in Chester, Pennsylvania, and worked with the Youth Hope Builders Academy at Interdenomination Theological Center. She's co-author with Ann uh, Wimberly, Dr. Ann Wimberly of Raising Hope, Four Paths to Courageous Living for Black Youth, which introduces the ways adults can become agents of hope in the lives of young people who might be the, in the midst of circumstances that seem hopeless. Further, she's currently working on a book entitled Hope in Confinement, Moving Toward a Pedagogy of Restorative Hope, which shares the extensive research she has done on the concept of hope as it is operationalized in the lives of incarcerated and formerly incarcerated women. Sarah Farmer is married to Ronnie Farmer and has lovely three children. Dr. Naja Riley received her MS and PhD degrees in clinical psychology from the University of Miami, Florida, and completed her clinical internship and postdoctoral fellowship at Boston Children's Hospital. Dr. Riley is a clinical psychologist with over 20 years of experience specializing in children, adolescents, and families, families, and is the author of the book, Anxiety and Depression in the Classroom, a teacher's guide for fostering self-regulation in young students. Dr. Riley's areas of research and clinical interests are treatment of anxiety, culturally informed practices, prevention, and the intersection between spirituality and psychology. Catherine Hyde is a licensed clinical social worker specializing in mental health psycho psychotherapy for children, adolescents, and families. She completed her uh, graduate work at the Brown School of Social Work at Washington University in St. Louis and held a clinical fellowship at Boston Children's Hospital, uh, a teaching hospital of Harvard Medical School. Kate worked closely with Dr. Nadja Riley at the Swinsred, uh, Swinsred Depression Prevention Initiative, providing training and consultation around adolescent depression and suicide awareness and prevention. She participated in the development of the Break Free from Depression documentary and school curriculum. Kate has held positions as clinical supervisor, adjunct faculty, lead facilitator, and consultant. Kate has worked with the Yale Youth Ministry Institute since 2013 as a lecturer and program coordinator, and served as a youth minister for a thriving youth program for many years. Please join me in uh, welcoming them on the floor. Hi, everybody. We are so happy to be here with you today. Really, thank you so much for taking the time out of your very busy schedules to join us. We're delighted to have the opportunity to see some of you again and to meet some new friends, so thank you. Um, so out of curiosity, I'm wondering if you could tell me a little bit about what made you decide to join us today? What was it about this topic that kind of drew you in? You can't. So community, you can't get away from it. That is the truth. <laughs> yes. Youth ministry is the future of our churches. Anyone else? Anyone else? Yes. Oh. Sorry? 
You came to hear Dr. Riley. <laughs> Dr. Riley's feeling very honored. Thank you. <laughs> um, well, was there someone else? Please. I came to hear Dr. Riley's honor. Because I had come so many times to things that you had put here together at Yale. And I so admired um, everything that she had had done so far, and I wanted to come today, and I brought my friend Rosalie, and we're interested in starting a youth program. And Christian Tabernacle loves Dr. Farmer. We're <laughs> all here to support you. Thank you, Dr. Well, we are very big fans of Dr. Farmer, too. <laughs> That's why we're here. Um, but we, we actually have had this incredible opportunity and I want to say thank you to Araceli's for helping us to do this again because we had the wonderful opportunity to come together as three people with um, different life experiences but with a very very common goal which is to really find a way to support our youth as they go through life in different spaces in a way that they could find a community that promotes emotional health and wellness. And so the purpose that we have for you today is really we're here, oh, let's see, we're here so we can offer a framework for integrating the psychological work and the theological work. Because the truth is, you're doing a whole lot of psychology when you meet with your kids, I am sure. You're hearing all about the struggles that they're encountering. You're trying to find a way to coach them and guide them as they come up to you with different areas of difficulty. And in order for us to really build a community that supports them, we can't really have, oh, go see the psychologist over there, and they take care of that stuff. Or we can't say, oh, just go to youth group, they take care of that stuff. We can't separate out who the child is. We really need to create a space that understands, acknowledges, and really uh, very intentionally addresses all areas of who they are as an individual. So when we started working together, we knew this was the case. We knew we had, all three of us, this great calling to kind of get to that place. And we were able to come uh, together to define what this community would look like. It would look like a relational community of flourishing where it's really a pro-social environment that focuses on the relationships within it to help the youth live with courage and resilience despite their circumstances. The community would offer a presence that nurtures the emotional and spiritual growth of each member, and that community would embrace them as they experience and manage their emotions so that they can retain hope and joy even when life is difficult or painful. And that community would really be a safe space that models the unconditional love, empathy for self, community, and the world. Now that's a wonderful goal, but how do we get there, right? That was the next big question that we had. How do we create a roadmap for that? And that's actually uh, something that we're very excited to present to you today, a roadmap. And as I'm sitting here doing this and looking at Kate, I realize <laughs> that um, I apologize. There's a very important story that is also part of our story in terms of how we got here. So before Kate introduces the framework, I'm sorry, I threw a monkey wrench in there for you. Um, we want to share that story with you because it, it really is part of what drew us to get to where we are today. And we hope that in some ways it will resonate with you too. Yes, and we've um, been uh, given permission to share this story with you all today. Um, and we felt that it was best to hear it from um, this youth, his own words that he shared with us. I was a junior in high school and drowning in a manic depressive episode of bipolar disorder. During my episode, I went so far as to create an incendiary device, which basically boiled down to a tennis ball with match heads in it. But it was enough of a concern to have me arrested and placed in juvie. The leaders of my youth group were a large support throughout the entire process, helping coordinate travel for my family to visit me for legal support during my arraignment. After having gone through the judicial process, it was determined I would go for psychiatric therapy while on academic suspension. Again, the youth group leaders came to help transport me. 
They visited me when possible and brought letters of support and encouragement from my fellow youth group members. Four days of juvie and two weeks of therapy later, I was released with the promise of outpatient therapy and medical support. After almost three weeks of minimal contact with the outside world, I was able to return to the youth group for a dinner party. While I was hesitant to attend, presuming it would be awkward at best and tar and feathering at worst, I was convinced by friends to attend. Not only was I welcomed with open arms, I was not judged, shunned, or otherwise set apart from the others. I was given the discretion to discuss or share my experiences as I saw fit. The youth group was also accepting of my other friends who were not members. These friends were happily welcomed to the dinner so they could visit with me. At no point in my times in youth group did group members ever set me apart or discourage me from attending. I've since taken that mentality and utilized it in my own endeavors. Having started and managed literacy groups, I made sure to drive home certain core rules. Attend when you're able. We're always happy to have you. You're always welcome anytime, regardless of your reason or regularity of attending. Always provide a constructive and positive atmosphere. Redirect or reject any toxic behavior or negative discussions. I also brought that concept of acceptance to support two companies I started. Supporting my employees, freelancers, and fans, I found that having such a positive and supportive mentality was appreciated by all and led it on to a pass it on mentality. So as this story demonstrates, the consequences of this young man's actions could have been detrimental or healing in a large part based on the community that was holding him up. And so this story shows you from his moment of crisis through his adult life, how the impact of this supportive community held him and supported him when he needed it the most. So based on the theological and psychological research, we have developed this framework that we think helps develop and maintain the, uh, the relational community of flourishing that we're talking about. We think these are the four core elements that will help these communities not just survive, but thrive through even the most challenging of times, both through individual group members, but also for the group as a whole. So we think that some of the best use of our short time here together today is to lead this into a discussion and an interactive portion of the time together. But before we do that, we want to initially introduce you to these four core elements. And then we're going to give you some time to dive a little deeper into how this concretely presents itself in your youth group or how you might want it to eventually. So the first element is connection. From the psychological perspective, this is at its basic sense that one is not alone. For adolescents, we understand that this is their connection to physical, psychological, social, and spiritual support. This is critical during adolescence because that the learning that they have to do about themselves and the world cannot be done in isolation. It must be done in a supportive community. And we know from the research that teens who have these secure connections are able to develop and understand themselves, relationships with others, how to deal with hardships, and really how to develop a sense of guiding values that will help them lead to a life full of joy. So theologically, I wanna say connection isn't just a good idea, but connection is a critical component of what it means to be human. And I think the concept, um, the African concept, Ubuntu, really captures this ideal really well. Um, most common way Ubuntu is explained is through the phrase, I am because we are. Other times is translated in the um, in Juni proverb, 
a person is a person through other persons. And at Nelson Mandela's memorial, the former President Barack Obama talked about Ubuntu by saying that we actually achieve ourselves by sharing ourselves with others and caring for those around us. In other words, who our young people become is intimately tied to who or what they are connected to. And so the CARE framework underscores young people's connection with God, self, and with others, and creation. Within the CARE framework, we emphasize mutuality. Connection is not unidirectional. Rather, connection is centered on sharing. Koinonia, which is a Greek word used throughout the New Testament um, to describe the early church, um, is translated as fellowship, communion, sharing, joint participation. And this is what we see relational communities of flourishing offering young people. Relational communities of flourishing become communities where young people participate in an experience of shared life together. They share both the good and the bad, the joys and the sorrows. Young people participate in shared learning and discovery of who God is while also discovering their own identity. Within the Christian tradition in particular, young people are invited to connect with a shared story and not only a shared story that began before they were born, but a shared story in which they can participate in, an ongoing story. A story that is revealed in scripture and shared traditions. Young people are also invited to participate in a shared mission and a shared discovery of what that mission is and what that mission looks like in their lives. And let's not forget they also get to participate in the shared power, the Holy Spirit. And so all of this sharing communicates to young people that not only are they connected to others in God, but they are connected to something so much bigger than themselves. God is one, but lives in community. So our call to be in community is really a call to reflect the very image of God. And I wanna talk about one more point, and that is what does connection actually feel like? Connection feels like family. Based on research with over 250 of the nation's leading congreg congregations, research at Fuller Institute affirms that when they explored congregations and how effective they were in engaging youth, the, the common thing that young people would say is, they feel like family to me. Th those that were deeply engaged and deeply involved in the congregational life, they felt like it was their family. And one of the things I have to say about the Christian tradition is we don't have to go far to affirm this. We are actually a family, part of this larger family. And even though sometimes because of how we have personalized Jesus and, you know, it's, it's sometimes difficult to think about family in that way, but this really is kind of what we're called to. We're called to community as a family of God. And the next element in our care framework is acceptance. And I think you would probably all agree with me when I say that we all crave acceptance, especially unconditional acceptance. But this can be difficult to, to learn and to practice. And this is especially true during adolescence. Uh, we hear from adolescents um, that this is a time of rejection and judgment and exclusion. This is something that is causing deep psychological harm for probably many of the youth that you are working with. And for this reason, it is so important that as we're developing communities, we develop them in a way that uh, shows the youth that their acceptance, their unconditional acceptance is guaranteed. And then we teach them through experience with others how to do this in their lives in the community, but then also how to 
embrace true acceptance of others and self throughout their lives. So in a developmental season where young people are already searching for where they belong, acceptance really does become critically important. And I think theologically, the greatest gift that we as a community can offer young people is acceptance. A community that models unconditional acceptance actually enables young people to experience a taste of grace. Within the Christian tradition, one of the greatest gifts God offers us is grace, a gift that is unmerited, undeserved, and unearned, and completely impossible without God. And so what does grace feel like? Theologian Paul Tillich, in a sermon entitled, You Are Accepted, describes this feeling as a voice that continually repeats, you are accepted, you are accepted. You are accepted. According to Tillich, grace feels like a welcome back home, especially in the midst of alienation and estrangement from the very ground of being, um, from God and, and others and even ourselves. What we also know is that young people in their schools or with their peers, they will sometimes feel unaccepted. That's something we just can't help how they feel outside of our context. But what we also know is that acceptance within a relational community of flourishing buffers against the rejection young people may feel in other spaces, while at the same time reinforcing the truth about who young people are, even in the face of rejection. A relational community of flourishing counters the message, you are not enough, by offering again and again you are accepted. You don't have to hide. I see that part of you. You are accepted. You don't have to perform. You are already amazing to me. You are accepted. You don't have to try harder. Just be yourself. You are accepted. Overall, God intends for community to reflect the divine gift of grace by offering acceptance through a radical embrace of all and by being there for and with all. In this way, acceptance within a community is sacramental, both pointing us to God, while at the same time becoming a very means to experience the grace of God. How do you follow that? <laughs> um, so all of these things that both Kate and Sarah have been talking about are fundamentally important to a longer term process that we call resilience. Now, when you take a look at the psychological literature, there are all these uh, checklists, right? Top 10 things that you can do to build uh, resilience in children or do these 10 things and you'll raise resilient um, students. It's not that easy. It's a lifelong process that needs to be supported by a community that offers that non-negotiable connection and acceptance. And so the way that we're really connecting these theories and defining resilience is by saying, we expect our young people to face hardship. We cannot buffer that from them, nor should we. It's actually not a good idea for us to solve all of their problems. They really need to learn the skills to be do, able to do things for themselves. However, we don't, in the process of having them figure things out for themselves, want them to deny or not accept the emotions they might be having. We don't want them to pretend that things don't bother them. We actually want them to experience what's going on, acknowledge their difficulties, but be able to label them, work with them, and grow from them. And that is a process that requires connection and acceptance at the bottom, scaffold, to be able to support those lifelong skills. Because eventually what we want is that each of those hardships, like it did for the story that we heard, the young man in that story, it made meaning for him as to what it would feel like, what it would be like to be an adult that can then have that as a part of his learning and be able to share that learning with others. 
And so theologically, <clears throat> I just want to reiterate that resilience is not just about what one overcomes or endures. Resilience is about what one produces and who one becomes as a result of being able to endure hardship. And so resilience for young people really becomes a way of knowing. They learn about their own inner strength, which results in endurance over the long haul. But they often learn about God's faithfulness and trustworthiness in the midst. And so it's something that, um, as they are becoming, it's something that they kind of build into themselves so that in the future they're also able to face uh, similar hardships. And what I love about um, the Christian tradition is we are not empty of witnesses that can testify about resilience. And so the Christian faith has historical examples that young people can imitate as they endure hardship, but we also have living examples, which is why this intergenerational kind of community becomes so, so important. Young people need to see models that have been there and done that and will not be afraid to share with them. And so in other words, relational communities of flourishing hold a reservoir of resources that young people can draw from to be resilient amidst hardship. And the last, the last um, one we wanna talk about, the last component is emotional safety. And theologically, anytime I think about emotional safety, the image comes to mind of just what it means uh, when the psalmist talks about God as a refuge. Um, even as Dr. Nadja Riley has already said, um, hardship comes. And we can't necessarily protect our young people from hardship, but what the psalmist really communicates is in the midst of all this vulnerability, there's a safe place to hide and to, and to go and to be. Um, and so not only do we advocate and um, uplift the relational presence of God, but once again, community actually becomes a refuge for young people as well. The community, a relational community of flourishing um, reflects God's refuge. Um, so that even um, when circumstances of life come that make young people vulnerable to stress and anxiety, um, the emotions, which are, which are very normal, um, the refuge kind of helps become a protective factor emotionally. Um, and the, the other thing I want to point, point out about emotional safety is that emotional safety is not just about young people staying in places of comfort. Rather, young people who experience a sense of um, safety are actually more likely to take risks and they're more likely to face challenges. And so if they're in spaces that are not safe, they, they often will be insular and kind of go into themselves or isolate themselves. But if they experience a sense of safety in a community, um, they are way more likely to take risks because they know they're not gonna be judged. They know they're not gonna be talked about behind their back, you know? And so this is really um, important to create. And so offering um, some information from the psychological perspective, emotional safety is actually so important for kids. In, in a world where everything for them feels so high stakes, right, they're always having to perform. They're in school, they're being evaluated in some way. They're in sports, they're being evaluated. They're in a lot of different arenas where outcomes feel very high stakes. I can't tell you the amount of times that I have met with fifth graders, sixth graders, and they're already thinking, I have to make sure I get all A's because if I don't, I'm not gonna get into the college that I want and my resume is not gonna look good. And in a world where we know that around sixth grade, kids stop doing things for the love of what they're doing and they play sports because they want to play and be with each other and now they're doing it because it's resume building. Everything just feels so high stakes that they do not have opportunities to be able to, as Sarah mentioned, go out of their comfort zones, be able to really break free and say, let me try this and if I fail, oh well, I learned something. So we want to create an island that feels very low stakes and that also feels very welcoming of this trial and error approach. That is, after all, how we learn. 
And so, f again, from the psychological perspective, that emotional safety does not mean that we will allow them to do anything without boundaries or without guidance. As a matter of fact, we also want to create some boundaries and expectations and values and guides that will help them take risks knowing that they're within a zone of comfort. And so we want you to um, participate in, in this um, exploration of the CARE framework. And so we just want to kind of sum up what we hope that we nurture through this framework. And what we hope to nurture is peace or calm in the midst of adversity or uncertainty. That's what we want our youth to experience. We want them to experience a sense of peace that allows them to be observant of themselves and of others. We want them to experience a sense of peace so that they're able to reflect upon the effects of one's words, actions, and presence. And we also want them to experience a peace to develop alternative ways of handling adversity and find joy. Hope, trust, peace, and joy. So one of the goals of these lunch and lectures is to give you all something to take with you when you leave. So it's not just an information dump, but it's also a time to understand and assimilate what we're talking about and then take it back to what you are already doing with your youth. So we are going to move into an interactive portion of our time together today. Um, we handed out pieces of paper when you all first sat down, and I apologize we don't have quite enough markers, but hopefully people at your tables brought um, some pens. We're gonna ask that as a group, you brainstorm the concrete ways that you are already embodying the elements of care within your youth communities, and also the ways in which you concretely hope to do this in the future. Um, please write these ideas down on that large piece of paper because we will be taking these um, into our continued work together and the writing that we are, are currently working on. Um, and then we're gonna ask you to report back. Uh, we're gonna ask you to choose two ideas at your table that you felt were, were maybe the most important or haven't been said out loud yet. So we're probably gonna give you about 10 minutes to do this. Um, and we'll come around and answer questions if you, if you have any.
When will we see you? Soon? Yeah, yeah, that would be that's a good idea. What about can you guys come and go visit? Uh, well, we just went yesterday. Just went yesterday. Yeah, that's how we. That's why the day the day. You should come. I tell you, you should do. It's going to be cold as hell in the summer. Come up in the summer. Come to the coast in Rhode Island. Come and then we'll we can come back down. Yeah. Yeah. That a good idea. Yeah. I'll plan it for you. Let me. I'm going to plan it for you. I absolutely will. I'll tell you. I'll just say that. So.
Okay, so we, we love to hear all the conversation that is going on. We're very excited. It sounds like this has really been helpful in getting you to talk together. Wondering if we can come back to the, to the larger group now, please. Thank you. We wish we had more time for you to talk because we know how wonderful it is when, when the creative juices get flowing. So thank you for taking the space to do that. Um, one of the things we would love to do now is hear maybe from a few tables the top two things that came out for you as you were talking, as you were brainstorming and thinking about your own youth groups. What two things would you want to report back to the group that really stood out for you from your group discussion? Do we have any volunteer tables? Do you want to, do you want to go ahead? Go ahead, go ahead. So, so from the area of positive psychology, there's a concept called flow. And so if you organize activities with that in mind, like a mission trip, uh, you do that, it generates this sense of elation. Uh, you lose track of time. You just feel like the world is, you're, you're accomplishing a lot. In that, you achieve these various um, sense of uh, resilience and, and all because you are accomplishing something in the process of helping others. And, and part of this is just a matter that those who are organizing the activities need to understand what the elements of flow are that you're trying to achieve so they build it into the activity. And then when you do the activity, if you've ever been on a sports team, for example, and played soccer or something, and you get to the end of the game and you go, wait a minute. I just started this game. The, the time just flew by. And, and, and that's one of the elements of, of flow because essentially you lose track of time. You have an activity where it's very measurable how you're doing and you have an activity that's not too hard, not too easy. And so it does require some planning, but within that context, you get this sense of community and you get this sense of basically making the participants really feel engaged and, and elated for being part of it. So thank you for sharing that. Something so important that you said was really the intentionality of the ones organizing the activity to really keep these things in mind in creating that for the kids. And when we think about mindfulness and being present and that flow, all of those components are so important. Thank you. We spoke a little bit about uh, community, and one of the things was um, trying to make ministry like a family. That's something that we've never tried at our church, so that was a, a kind of an eye-opener for us, because maybe if we go, if we try something like that, it would involve not only the children, but maybe also the parents as well to get them involved. And our second thing was recognizing the gaps where values of the home life may not align with values in the church. And that's really a, a hard thing because at home you're taught certain values, certain things to do. You come to church, you're taught something extremely different from what you're used to. So again, that's trying to um, recognize the gaps where the values of the home life may not align with the values of the church. And it sounds like what you're saying is that that wouldn't prevent one from being in the group of the church, but really everyone having the patience and understanding of what's going on while somebody makes that adjustment to that new family value group. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. Good afternoon. So our table was basically all in the same vein regarding um, consistency. Um, and, and we spoke on it in, in different, at different levels. Um, consistency in what they see, what our youth see with us and in us as we daily walk through our own lives. Mm -hmm. Consistent in um, encouraging them um, 
and enlightening and, and giving them um, an enlightenment about, about their strengths rather than always focusing on weaknesses, as well as being um, giving them more um, things to participate in that in the realm of where they are right now generationally, like mm -hmm. meeting them where they're at. A lot of times we want to bring them up here mm -hmm. where we are and we have to meet them where they're at. We don't lower who we are to meet them, but we have to go to where they are in order for us to reach them. And we need to be consistent with that because a lot of times we want to bring them into a place that they have no understanding of. There's so much stuff that comes at our youth, you know, in this, in this time and season, emotionally, um, you know, um, spiritually, mm -hmm. you know, all the chatter and stuff in the atmosphere. We have um, social media and we were talking about reality TV and the things that they, that they see. I mean, even on YouTube, I, I have young, young, Godchildren, like five, six years old, that know how to go to YouTube yes. and look at things that are so inappropriate, and they get those things in their spirit. So we have to be consistent in how we're guiding them and what they're seeing in us, so that they know how to handle the flow of what's going on with them and in their life. So thank you so much for that. And you know what I hear and what you're saying oh. is um, consistency is part of what builds emotional safety right. and following through. Right. But it also includes you being genuine. Amen. It doesn't mean that that you're embodying something that is unachievable for them. Uh, absolutely. And it also means that you're being mindful of developmentally where they are. Right. Thank you. Thank you. So we'll do one more. I'd like to thank the table mm -hmm. over there because what I was hearing her also saying is connection, connecting with mm -hmm. them, connecting with them where they are. Uh, we brought up example like if they on the phone or on the um, um, headphones, yes. you know, instead of saying, get off with it, don't, what you listen to? Yeah. Can you help me with this? You yeah. know, try to go where they are and before you can bring them where you want them to go. Because mm -hmm. you have to find out what needs they need and then you can understand. Plus, there is a trust going back and forth mm -hmm. because they trust you because they say, wait a minute. They listening to me. Right. They hear me and they yes. feel me. So I think connection. And once you have that connect them with that person or the group, then you they accepting you, and then you you'll be able to um, teach them or guide them in a more uh, di direction of where they you want them to go or where they should go with yeah. the guidance of God. Of that's course. right. But uh, I think that's the whole thing: connection with exception and then they would come, like you said earlier, resilient, you know, because now they feel confident. They feel that someone got their back mm -hmm. and someone care about who they are. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you. And we, we realize that there is so much more in terms of the wealth of conversation that you had that um, we apologize we don't have time to get to. But one of the things we want to emphasize is that as we continue to develop this, we really want to co-construct it with you. So we would love to take those pieces of paper, if that's OK, so that we can really learn more about all of the rich conversation that happened. And so we have um, a bit of a challenge for you um, as you go back into your work with the youth. Um, a little bit of homework. So um, the, the last si slide asked the question, how well is your, is your group doing with each element of care? And so we encourage you to talk amongst yourselves and your, um, your leadership team and really ask yourselves this question, um, how well are we doing with each element of care? Um, and we also strongly believe, and I'm sure you do too, that the youth's voice matters so, so, so much. So not just asking yourselves this, but going back and asking your youth, how well are we doing with this as a community? Um, and really taking some time for evaluation. So maybe um, coming up with a very um, 
low-key scoring of, of how we're doing this and then compare what the youth are reporting to what you all have reported um, and then making a shared improvement commitment you know being very transparent with what you're trying to accomplish as a community and making changes where they are necessary and making a commitment to improve those things together and and being true to your word so following up and following through And we want you to stay in touch with us. We want you to stay connected um, because um, as we will con we'll continue to work together and collaborate on this um, mental health promotion, so we'll take what we did with depression and suicide um, uh, last year or a year or whenever we did it, a couple years ago, a couple summers ago now, um, and also with this work on communities of relational flourishing, and we'll be building in other elements of it to really talk about mental health promotion. And so we really want to know um, how this experience of evaluation goes in your youth group. So we've put up our emails. Feel free to connect and contact us. Um, and I also know um, we're going to end... Um, this portion, because I know that some people have to leave and go back to work, but I wanted to uh, provide some bl a blessing um, that as you go, may the peace of Christ go with you wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness, protect you through the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again into our doors. give a hand to our ladies and for the work that they're doing and continue to do. How many of us, do we care? Do we care? Yes, I said that earlier. We're like, we got it. That's a slogan. Do we care? And um, this is very important. This work is very important. I thank you all for the work that you continue to do. Um, this generation needs us. This generation truly needs us, and it's truly um, inspiring when I sit around and I hear that we do care, and we really want the best for them, and we want to meet them where they are. So thank you again for the work that the three of you have done together um, and continue to do as um, we will see that this work will be published and this work will be um, available for us all as well, okay? But we also want you to share this work with others. So if you know, we videotape, um, and we're live right now so what you could do is visit us on YouTube and in our YouTube channel you will see all of our videos that you can share with others okay and make sure you like tag us on your social media outlets as well we want to remind you all that we are back next month on the 3rd of April and we will continue the conversation um, of working with young people but in the area of compassion we will welcome Dr. Frank Rogers from Claremont School of Theology so we will gather here in the this space again and then next month we will also be launching and letting you know what we will be doing during our summer symposium so stay tuned for that we're excited to um, prepare we're preparing something amazing for the first week of June so we'll get get you more information on that okay but at this moment, we're going to stop. We're going to pause. And for those of you who need to leave, we thank you. I know some of our students have classes. And then we're going to just pause, and then we're going to do some Q&A, okay? Thank you, and God bless you.